All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the community table in person. Um, I'm Laura Albavias. I'm the uh, training and coordination manager here at the Coalition for the Homeless. So thank you for coming out today. And if you haven't signed in, there's a sheet over here on the table for you to sign in, grab some snacks. Uh, there's stickers over there. And um, come on in, come on in. <laughs> Just sign in over here on the table. And um, just a, a couple items before we get started. Our uh, Wi-Fi and password information is right here on this wooden sign uh, on this post if you need that. And then if you need the restroom, the key is on this closet door right here. And um, that there's one key, but it'll open either the uh, men's or the women's restroom. So if you need that, just grab it and be sure to put it back when you're finished. Um, our speaker today on um, tenant and landlord rights and responsibilities is Rebecca Cotton from Legal Aid. And she's been doing this a while. She knows her stuff and um, she's going to share her wisdom with us. If you have questions, don't be shy about uh, raising your hand or um uh, standing up and, and asking, and um, she's giving you some information. Does everybody have a packet of information? Okay. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Rebecca. Thanks so much. Thank you guys for being here. Um, I want you to know I brought a nice little sweater so I can be very professional-like, but it's warm. <laughs> and if I put it on, I will be much less animated. So here we go with the tank top. Um, so little bit about me just so you know who's talking to you um I've been practicing law 14 years uh, went to law school late with kids and uh was motivated by deep and loving concern for my brother who has schizophrenia and had been homeless much of my adult life um so I don't just do this as a job I really care about what I do. Um, I really care about the people that we serve. The worse shape they're in, the more I care. <laughs> um, so I just want you to know that that's, that's who's speaking to you today. This is not just a job for me. I imagine a lot of you are in this because you have bleeding hearts and you care about the people that, that the coalition touches. Um, so I just want you to know that you're, you're in the room with other people that feel the same. Uh, so I started out of protection and advocacy. I'm not sure if it, if you guys are aware of them, but they're a statewide organization that represents folks who have disabilities of any kind. They're amazing. They are wonderful. I haven't been there for a minute, but I was there for seven years um, advocating for folks. Um, a lot of what we did was non-litigation, we did a lot of advocacy in the prisons. We did a lot of advocacy for people in segregation. Um, we did, uh, on the adult team, we advocated a lot for folks who were in and out of psych hospitals and other institutions. We did death investigations and we had, we pretty much served the same population, folks that are in and out of institutions or on the street. Um, that's where I cut my teeth as a lawyer. After being in the SEG units for a few years, I really needed a change of pace, wanted to do something differently, and I really wanted to litigate. So I moved to Virginia and I took a job as a prosecutor. And you may think, wow, how does someone go from representing the most disenfranchised to a prosecution role? I wanted to figure out and learn how to litigate. So that was the best possible position that I could be in. I was gonna be in court every day. I was gonna learn the ins and outs of the criminal justice system. I went in there with a mind to change it. I came out of it with a mind to <laughs> not go back. Um, so litigating in as a prosecutor, a lot of people really believe that prosecutors don't do anything to help people. The truth is a prosecutor can do a lot more for a defendant than a PD. They can toss the case without question. They can look at things that, that are mitigating factors. They can negotiate any kind of out of court scenario to help that person avoid 
conviction. Um, I did my job as honestly as I could, but you can't be what you're not. So I couldn't, I couldn't do some things in that job. And I just, you know, I did it for seven years. It was a wonderful experience. It prepared me to be in the courtroom. And then COVID hit and everything just went south for everyone. Um, and I decided when my kids graduated from high school in Virginia that I was going to come back to Louisville and try to get back in the game. Something where I'm advocating for this population but also litigating. Here we are at Legal Aid. So I took the job at Legal Aid. I've been there three and a half years. I have done nothing but housing justice work since I started. I started out being a staff attorney in eviction court. And then in my last couple of years, um, Legal Aid has a lot of turnover, but we also have a lot of young lawyers who haven't practiced a lot. So um, quickly went from practicing in the eviction court to training attorneys to practice in eviction court, to training volunteer attorneys to practice eviction cases. And we got a grant where we were able to expand our services and evictions um, to, to go and recruit volunteers who are attorneys in the community to take pro bono cases and eviction. Since I started that program, we have 40 volunteer attorneys who do not do this for, for a living. They do it for free. And that pro bono army has allowed us to represent a lot more people in eviction court. So I continue to train those attorneys. I continue to advocate in the courtroom. I do still practice in eviction court, um, but my main goal and objective is to train folks and to recruit volunteers. So before we get started, I'm doing y'all a solid and I want you to think before we leave today, I'm gonna to ask our lovely host if she has a blank piece of paper. If you are friends with or know an attorney who is licensed to practice in Kentucky, who might consider if asked doing pro bono eviction, I would like their name. And then I would like your name next to it. And I wanna say, this person thought you might be interested and I will reach out to them. You don't have to do anything. I just need a name. I can find them. All licensed attorneys are listed on the KBA website, so I can find them, and I can tell them that you sent me, and that would be just amazing if you would think about anybody in your family, and this includes, like, if you're friends with a third-year law student um, who's about to become an attorney, I want to know about it because those kids, they're hungry and they want to go and they're ready to go. And so that would be, that would be fine if you know somebody in law school too. So we're going to do my basic training that I do for volunteers. This is designed for lawyers. And, um, and so if, if it's like, I lose you, please just wave and be like, can you just, what does that mean? I'm happy to back up and slow down. Um, this training is designed to be an hour long, so we have plenty of time to stop and ask questions if something, and if, if there's a scenario in your mind, someone you're working with now, an issue that you're having, and what I'm talking about is relevant, please interrupt, let's talk about it, like it's fine. I wanna do that. Um, it would be silly for you to be here today and know someone who's having a situation and us not talk about it. So let's talk about it if, if you do. Um, so Ash Khan used to be my paralegal. He helped design this training. I still leave his name on it because he did a lot of work. Um, he's working for a councilwoman now. So if you want to lobby to change the law, he's your guy. Legal aid is stuck with what the law is. We can't help people outside of the law. All we can do is tell them, this is what your rights are. This is likely what's going to happen in court based on my understanding of the law and what you've told me, this is likely what's going to happen. We're stuck with what the law is. So today, if you decide I don't like the law and you want to do something about it, he's your guy. <laughs> Okay, so 
Eviction Court is on Zoom in Jefferson County, Kentucky. Anyone can go and watch Eviction Court. If you are curious about this and how it's playing out in real life, and you want to watch some real Judge Judy, you can log into the Zoom court. It's courtroom 308. You just go to the Jefferson County District Court website. You look for courtroom 308. You type, you, you, you click on the Zoom. They have court. Don't be shocked by this. Every day of the week. Wow. Monday and Tuesday, Monday through Friday, let me, bleh, let me black up. Monday through Thursday, they have a 9 and 10 a.m. docket. Those dockets are first sitting cases. When your client or the person that you know has an eviction court date and they're served a subpoena, it's going to either be at 9 or 10, Monday through Thursday. Sometimes, there's too many eviction cases in this county to fit on that docket. So there'll be a special docket created because we're just overflowing with the need to evict people. So we have nine and 10. The 11 o'clock docket is a second city. If you're on the 11 a.m. docket, you've been to court already. And you either ask the court to pass the case for you to move out, or you've asked the court to pass the case for you to pay in full. And if you've done that, paid in full or moved and returned the keys at the 11 o'clock docket, your case will be dismissed. If you show up and you tell the court you're out, the judge tells people every single day, you're making an agreement to move out and return the keys or pay in full, but you have to come back at 11 and make sure it gets dismissed because the landlord who's suing you is not your buddy. And they don't care if you get an eviction judgment. Now, if you're a landlord and you have a landlord's attorney, you have an obligation to the court to tell them if you know that they moved or you know that they paid. But if you don't know, not your obligation. How many of you think people come back and tell the court what happened? <laughs> Nine times out of 10, they turn in their key at 1045 on the day of the review and they don't come back to court. It says Zoom. All they had to do was click the link. Judge, I'm out. Turn in the keys this morning. We have a question. So that stops them from getting an eviction on their record. Yes. And we're going to get more in depth about why that is um, as the, the training goes. So right now, right, we're going to get more involved if, with that question. So you're going to understand fully. But I just want you all to see. Eviction court is happening in Jefferson County all the time, every day. And each docket has up to 100 different cases on it. It's just volume, enormous volumes. People um, <clears throat> who have an attorney with legal aid or a private bar attorney, which most people cannot afford to pay an attorney to go to eviction court, because they can't pay their rent <laughs> or, you know, there's a reason why legal aid represents in this courtroom. It's because by, you know, design, the people that are facing eviction cannot afford to hire someone to represent them. And that's also why we have the volunteer attorney program, because the volume is so enormous. So, if you go to court on the 9 or 10, which is the first sitting, and you have an attorney, and you have a legal defense, we're going to talk about what those are today, you can ask for a trial. You have a right in eviction court to a bench trial, which is just the judge deciding, or a jury trial. If you want a jury trial in eviction court, you have to put that in writing and give it to the judge. It is required by the statute. If you go in there and you want a trial, 
you'll get your trial if you have an attorney and it'll get scheduled probably for one o'clock the next week on Monday. That's the trial docket. That's where the cases that are highly contested have two attorneys and there's evidence to provide. That's when they take place. The judges are not always fair to people who are unrepresented. Sometimes if a person goes in there on the nine or 10, it's their first day in court, they just came in there, they want a trial. They don't have an attorney. The judge says, what's your issue? They're mm -hmm. unprepared. They haven't asked for an attorney. They don't really know what their issue is, but they're contesting it. If they can't articulate something that convinces the judge they have a legal issue, she will do the trial right then. Mm -hmm. Or she'll say, last chance, you can move or pay me a week. Or we're going to do the trial right now. If you think this is fair, please raise your hand. Oh, sorry. No, I thought you were fair. That sounds terrifying. Don't have my hand. We so, recommend for somebody who's going through that that we're like we're in housing and we have somebody who's having that situation. What so would this, we advise them? This to brings do? us <laughs> to this brings us to how you get the word out. So the coalition has printed a flyer <clears throat> and it has information about calling legal aid. That flyer gets served when the sheriff sends the subpoena. It goes with it. So the only reason I can sleep at night is I know the people that walk in there unrepresented, they got a flyer from the coalition. I know they did because Tina Ward Pugh and, and George Eklund and Judge Leibson even all worked it out, paid for the printing, got the sheriff to agree to send these people this information at the time they get their subpoena. And it's awful to watch, and I encourage you to go watch eviction court one day because it will inspire you to fight harder, but that's the best we can do is get them the information before they show up in court. Yes. Sorry for my next question. Mm -hmm. So no if problem. they reach out to you guys with that flyer, how long does it take for you guys to get back with them, to be able to represent them depending on the time frame of their court date? So it just depends. Mm -hmm. It just depends. We have, like I said earlier, a lot of turnover. We've just trained new, two new housing attorneys. Um, we have a large group of volunteer attorneys who take eviction defense cases pro bono, but you should get a call within a week of when you call and your subpoena is months before. Okay. So the subpoenas that are going out right now, they'll be heard sometime late October, maybe early November, because the court, as I'm saying, it is a sea of individuals. Jefferson County evicted, I think it was 17,000. It is enormous. It's just an enormous amount of, of Is the flyer you send out um, specific to that individual or is it a flyer that you can use for anybody? It's a general flyer and it has information on whatever rental systems remains, which- How do you get access to it? It comes, the flyer is included when the sheriff serves the paperwork on but the patient. How can we get how access? Can we get oh, access? we can attach that. I can get yes, a copy please. of that yeah. and, and send that to you all. That'd be great. Um, we also make an announcement every week in eviction court. If you have a savvy tenant who shows up on the first court date and says something that sounds like a good legal argument, she'll say, we'll see you back next Monday at one because she's heard something that indicates there's an issue here and they can call legal aid, but they've got to do it right away. Like, you know, most of us, I mean, it's like the PD's office. You guys hear this, it's just enormous volume. We know our stuff, we know what we're doing, but it's a lot of people. Um, okay, so that's eviction court. That's how it rolls in Kentucky. On Friday, they have a motion hour docket. Um, if 
they used to do a lot more motions where people would say, I had a problem with the Zoom judge. I was present. I couldn't be heard. And they would let the person put it on the Friday motion hour docket. They're not as merciful anymore. Mm -hmm. the, the COVID mercy has dried up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and so they may have a really nice landlord attorney on that case who will talk to them and maybe work something out. But but that Friday docket, that the, now they're using it to, the last time I was on the Friday docket, one of the landlord's attorneys was asking the court to hold the sheriff in contempt for not getting people set out fast enough. <laughs> it, was, it was not fast enough. So they feel like it's unfair to them. So, so that's what the Friday docket is. And sometimes they, they'll do some first sitting case, cases on the Friday docket um, because they they filled up the other dockets. And those flyers are just for different kind of people. They are. I know those legal aid like different. They go out. So when the clerk issues all that stuff to the sheriff, mm -hmm. it all goes out together. The flyer with the information to call and the, the thing. So thank God for George Eklund and Tina ward -Pew and the people that are advocating to get that information in people's hands. But I will tell you, People are not calling us when they get served. Right. They're calling us a week before their court date. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. And we can help so, so much more the earlier we know. Right. And then we have the other extreme. We have people that call us when they get their landlord notice, which is not, they haven't been served on an eviction, and that's too soon. So, like, they're calling on a 14-day or a 30-day notice. Yes. Yeah. So... I have passed out today the Uniform Residential Landlord Tenant Act outline. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to teach this to you because we would all be asleep, especially in this heat. We're going to talk about a lot of this stuff today. And this is a reference for you. You can say, I know we talked about this with Rebecca. Apologies. Um, I know we talked about this with Rebecca. But if you read through this, you're going to see all the stuff that we talked about today, and you're going to see the legal reference, the Kentucky Revised Statute, from what we talked about. So it'll help you kind of, if you want to dig deeper on an issue, you can look up the KRS online, you can just Google it, and it'll show you the statute. So if you got if you got a client that's like, that's not the law, <laughs> and, <laughs> I have rights. You can say, okay, let me look a little deeper and pass that to them. So that's the kind of thing um, that this is for. Um, but we're going to talk about a lot of the stuff that's in here. Um, this is the governing law in Jefferson County. It's also in Lexington and in Shelbyville, the city, but not the county. <laughs> Uralta is uniquely adopted by particular places. Jefferson County has adopted Uralta. This does not apply across the state. This applies to Jefferson County. It's more common to see Uralta protections in place in an urban setting. Kentucky is 99% rural, but this is the law here, and the, the most evictions happen here in Jefferson County. So um, you can reference this um, this has recently been updated. There's some, some more stuff in here too that might be helpful to you. I really encourage you to read it at some point. Um, but that's the body of law, the Uniform Residential Landlord Tenant Act. Um, a lot of you are going to have clients who are in federal or HUD subsidized properties. So there is more protections in place for a person who's on a Section 8 voucher or who is getting... Uh, some sort of reduced rent based on they qualify for some federal program. Yes. What about, so my program, um, I work at Home of the Innocents, and HUD essentially pays all of our clients rent. It, it It's weird as, you know, who is who, but it's all from a HUD grant. Would that be considered uh, with this to right. be... HUD subsidized housing. I want to say yes, absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Thank yes. you. I want to say yes. I haven't read that HUD grant. I don't I don't know who's paying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So usually we hear something from the tenant. They're telling us their story, or we ask them, how much do you pay in rent? And they're like, oh, 80 bucks. <laughs> and we're like, okay, we know what we're dealing with at that point. Then we just have to get the lease. We have to find out who's funding it and what protections are provided. Typically, those programs have re a required lease addendum of some kind that includes those protections on the addendum. We can also find it in the lending. So there's some properties out there that get tax benefits because they provide low-income housing eligibility. Mm -hmm. Those properties have those additional protections too. It is not a simple case if you've got a fed, federal funder and you're getting some kind of grant funding. It's more complicated. The person needs to have their lease. They never have their lease. <laughs> never. You get 20 copies. <laughs> it wouldn't matter. Um, I would just give anything to have a bank, like a lease bank, for, for all those that receive subsidized housing because it would just be so amazing. Yes. I've noticed, I want to say something to Paul, and I've noticed that, you know, we have people on campus and stuff that some have no income, some have the income, and just their rent based off of that. And of course, there's a HUD grant, like she was talking about. And I have noticed that it really takes a while for them to actually get evicted. Oh, yeah. But if they would, I mean, a lot of them would wait until the day or two before court mm -hmm. to try yeah. and get a hold of somebody. It's true. Instead of, you know, and then some people I've seen in the past that have their rent is up to ten thousand dollars that they haven't and they haven't paid. Oh, and then when they get finally get when they get the eviction thing and they get all the chances and the compliant non compliances and they don't show up for their grievance hearing and all that and then it goes over to the you know, the process, yeah. the process. Then they wanna get mad and throw up throw a fit. Yeah. <laughs> I understand, but at the same time. When you're given your non compliances and you're given your chances after chance after chance after chance, and I believe me, I don't want nobody homeless. I really don't. I really don't. I don't. But sometimes it becomes frustrating. Yeah. When you have really, I mean, I've had something I have said pretty much. Why don't you contact this person? Why don't you contact me? Why don't you do this? And they don't. But when they get their eviction or whatever, they ready to cuss you out. <laughs> You know, and I mean, it's not that I'm complaining because I've been cussed out before. That's so okay. Sure. You're in the trenches. <laughs> you know, so and, long, I'll be cussed out and, <laughs> and you're in the room with with, with, with people that. Are... <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's just um, in like I said, I've noticed in our house, it takes a heck of a lot to get. Whatever. Well, I will tell you, some it's, of that is shifting, and and that's true. That's true. We'll see cases where the person got their first notice letter in January, and here we are in June, <laughs> you know, at, in eviction court. So they knew about it, uh, but they they have they have the same rights regardless of when they reach out for help. So if somebody reaches out to me and they have a legal defense and the landlord did something wrong, I don't care when they acted on it. If the case comes in front of me and the landlord didn't do it right, or the landlord was merciful and waited five months to file, that was on them. That's not my time. That's not, they decided to do that. They decided to give them grace for that many months before they filed. They still have to do it right. They have to follow the procedures as it's set out in the law. And if the person doesn't have a defense, then we have to come to Jesus, mm -hmm. which is what you're talking about. And I have to do that every day. I review the case. If I find a legal defense, they will have no better advocate. If I don't, I'm telling them, you will get out or you will get the eviction. And that's all there is to do, you know, to it. You either have a defense or you don't. So, so I will tell you though, legal aid has improved. Sadly, we've educated the landlord bar 
they're not making as many mistakes oh, no. because we're in there and they know we're looking for those particular things. And the smarter attorneys where this is all they do is evictions, they know what our arguments are. It's not a secret. The law is the law. If they do it right, they get possession of the property. So, you know, so I think it's good to have an educated bar that follows the process correctly. I think that it's better for all of us if they do it right from the outset. There's a lot less discontent amongst landlords. Um, and, uh, but I, I find defenses even with some of those guys because we're human. They put the wrong date on there. They put the wrong address on there. They didn't list the person that's actually named on the lease. You know, there's all kinds of things that you can look for and that can help somebody get some more time. And we're in the business of grace. That's the, that's the people we represent. And frankly, I just don't feel sorry for any of the landlord attorneys because I am literally, most of the people that I represent make a quarter of what I do and they are living somewhere paying more than what I do yeah. to live there. And that is not true for those that qualify for those HUD subsidies, but here's the piece on that. There's a reason that person qualifies and I'm not looking at the exception that's taken advantage. Those people qualify for those programs because they have hardships that I know nothing about. And so we go in and we get them time and we get them grace. <laughs> Sometimes I represent people more than once. Mm -hmm. We're on round two. I'm sorry, landlord attorney. attorney. Uh, you did this wrong the first time. We pointed it out and you did it wrong again. <laughs> you have to do it right. Just do it right. We won't raise a defense if it's not there. So that's the law on this. Um, make sure with anybody that you're helping that's in a situation, if they call legal aid, we are very familiar with what most of the buildings are that are HUD property. So as soon as you tell intake where they're living, we're going to know. But you want us to know up front if this is a person who's in some kind of subsidized housing. Because that's the population we most represent the folks that will be on the streets. That person is not going to be able, unless they get another HUD subsidy location, they're not gonna be able to afford rent anywhere. So we know that an eviction from that property is a sentencing to the street. Mm -hmm. End of discussion. If a person goes, I had a member uh, that I work with who had a disability and she, it was, uh, I believe it was like based on her income she was living at and she, we, we have a program that can help up to $500 for proof that needed like eviction through Humana. And um, I was trying to get it for her, but her landlord wouldn't take it. Um, a lot of those programs have well, conditions. So, I don't know what Humana's conditions are. So ours isn't like, ours is like we can send a check or we can pay like a credit card if there's a website for us to go to. Will so, Humana pay the person directly? They have to be, the landlord has to be paid directly. That's your problem. So, oh. however, we've talked about like possibly sending the money to the, the member and then they can use pay the landlord, but the there was just like the it's a new program that just happened that just started this year with the benefits. How many of you have heard about the new source of income issue? Okay. So it used to be that in Jefferson County, Louisville, that you could not discriminate based on the source of income mm -hmm. for the person that you're renting to. And then our wonderful legislature decided that that wasn't fair to landlords and they extended that. And not only did they extend that law, they said no other community can do that in Kentucky, what? can make that a law. So basically the landlord can say, I'm not going to rent to you because you have a section eight voucher. And I'm not going to rent to you because you got rental assistance. Like, even if it's like, uh, who was doing the, the security deposits and, and oh, Urban League? Urban League. Urban League was doing that, and some of them were refusing to accept that to get the person back housed. Um, so now they can do it. And there's that I think thing. Part of that too is like if it's not paying the full amount, like they're pledging a partial payment, mm -hmm. landlord cannot say if it's not the whole payment, we're not accepting. Which sadly is 
reasonable <laughs> because and I mean, other part. because yeah. in a lot of cases that rental assistance is a fraction of what is owed. Yeah, right? landlord feeling is especially with fifteen hundred dollar a month rent. Yeah. When I first moved out of my house, my parents' house, I paid five nineteen a month. Anybody lower? Three sixteen. Three sixteen. No, three hundred a month in the Highlands. For three bedroom. Yeah, in nineteen ninety seven. So we have, you know, we people are facing a totally different scenario. Wait, four hundred for a room. So this PowerPoint will be available to you, and it lists all these different laws, and these links work. So if you want to, you can go and look at these links after the um the training. Oh, is that first link what you handed out? It is. It is the link to find everything that's in that outline. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. But that outline is not at that link. That okay. outline is a legal aid created document okay. to help people understand where that link goes. If you get, if you go straight to the Uralta on the Kentucky Revised Statutes, you're gonna have questions. So hopefully the outline will will point you in the right direction to the different things if you have questions. And you can you can always reach out to legal aid with a legal question. Um we have a lot of folks who come to court who have diminished capacity of some kind. Um legal aid attempts to represent those folks to the best of our ability. We only get tripped up if we genuinely believe that they're not capable of forming a, a, an attorney-client relationship. So like they come to us and say, I want you to be my lawyer. But then everything you're telling them, they don't understand it. And you know if they sign this thing that you don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> you're giving them legal advice and you're not sure it's connecting. <laughs> So in that case, we do have an opportunity to ask the court to appoint someone to represent them because we believe that they have diminished capacity of some kind. So, and typically we like to back that up with some documentation, some kind of medical record or something. Sometimes we just let the court talk to them for a minute and we just step back a little bit like, to introduce my client judge, I'm concerned that we're not able to form an attorney-client relationship. And they just talk to the, the judge for a few minutes and it's very clear that they're not okay. Um, but it's important for someone to advocate for a GAL in that instance, because the judge is up there. She's got these huge dockets, right? We've been talking about this. All these people, they're in a hurry. They don't have time for so-and-so has this issue and that issue. Well, will you move out? And this person is very vulnerable in that moment. They're being pressed to make a decision about, am I gonna, what am I gonna do? And they have no understanding. So even if you have a client like that, um, we would have to get their permission to talk to you, but stay involved <laughs> so that we can work with somebody that's working with them. Okay. You do have a right to counsel in eviction court, but that right is uh, to contact and get assistance from legal aid before your court date. So you get to court, you don't have a lawyer, you haven't called anybody, you haven't done anything. It really is too late at that point. All right. And that's, that's at the first setting, right? Um, typically, What's going to happen is going to happen at the first sitting, unless there's an attorney there who's demanding a trial or a jury trial, um, or by some happenstance of luck, that tenant articulates something to the judge that the judge goes, that may be a legitimate defense, and they will set it. Otherwise, if they're just telling their sob story, She's going to go ahead right then. She's not going to wait for them to get an attorney. So that's that's the reality. And I always tell people, at Legal Aid, 90% of what we do is listen because this person needs to be heard. 
They've tried to tell what this landlord's done to them to a hundred people and nobody has cared. You know, they have legitimate complaints. There is legitimate maintenance issues. There is stuff going on and they just need to be heard. And they are so shocked when they go to court and the judge does not have time to hear them. And she won't. She won't get into any of that. And it's just hard because we're happy to talk to them, but at that point, it's too late. It's too late. Do you usually give them resources or places that might help them with the rent? If it's like we have stayed as as good as we can. Rental assistance has been like a roller coaster mm -hmm. shift, um, but we have stayed in touch with the people that are doing it, and we do have a resource sheet that we that intake gives everybody. Like even if we don't represent them in court, they send them that information. Um, but rental assistance is slow and I'll shoot straight with you unless they've already applied and been approved by the time they call us, it's not going to do anything for them. It it's, doesn't help in the court. It's too slow. It's too slow and the landlords are fed up and they just want them out. And that's sad because it used to be just like we were, we were like praised as a city nationally for how we distributed rental assistance initially. And now we, we just, we can't, we just can't do it same. Okay, so this is the second piece. These are the technical defenses that we look for. We look to make sure that the plaintiff, the person who's suing the person to get them, to get them out, we look to see if they actually own the property. You'll be surprised how many people sue for an eviction on a property they have no ownership interest in, and they are not the pro <laughs> they are not the legitimate property uh, manager of that property. Wow. We get tons of them dismissed on this issue. The other thing that they do is maybe they are a legitimate property management company, but they haven't bothered to tell the Secretary of State about their business for like three years. Oh. So their, their business is defunct, <laughs> like based on the state's records, it, they've already been, you know, dissolved because they haven't taken care of their business. And that's just sloppiness. And can they fix it? Yes. But can we get it dismissed? Yes. <laughs> and they have to start over, which gives your client time. So that's one of the most basic things. Who are you dealing with? Is this person have a right to this property at all? Like who is suing for possession? Um, then there is eviction court is called a court of, it's like a special, a specialty court. It's a court that has special rules that are outside of like the general practice of law. So there's a rule, there's a civil rule that says that you can amend your complaint and you have umpteen days to do that and you have all this stuff. Well, none of that applies in eviction court because eviction court is a specialty court and it only, it's very quick. So all these other civil rules where you could just drag the case out, y'all know how lawyers do, drag it out, amend it, change it, you know, special requests to, to modify, all that stuff does not apply in eviction court. So we use that when the lawyer, when the attorney comes to court and their complaint is missing like whole sections. We're like motion to dismiss. And they're like, judge, we're making a motion to amend the complaint to fix it. Well, sorry, you can't. Eviction court's a specialty court. Those particular rules are not designed. The timelines don't match what eviction court does. So they're not allowed to amend their complaint. They used to do this all the time. They put the wrong address on there. They serve the wrong address. They just want to amend the complaint and reserve the person. We would fight against that. We would say, you can't do that in eviction court. You have to start over. This case needs to be dismissed. So that's that's something we do too. When you say start over, how long is that process for them before it's an official like, eviction? It's a complete do-over. Okay, so everything has to be like paper on the beginning. So okay. for subpoena, they have to notice the, the defendant again. Then once they meet that requirement, they have to file again. Another like 30 day notice. And then file, okay. the whole process restarts. Yeah. Um, 
So, so that's some of the, the games that we play. It's public defender law. It's not that they're not guilty. They are guilty. They didn't pay their rent or they had a dog and they shouldn't have, or they, you know, like they did all this stuff, but you got to read them the rights. You can't go forward on this. So it's games, you know, it's, it's games, but it's, it keeps it fair. You have to do your part right in order to get possession of the property. So that's what we do. We check all that stuff. And then we look at another big thing that we do is we look at the landlord's behavior after the filing of the complaint. So they file their complaint with the court. We don't have one of these other defenses that we've already talked about. And we find out from the tenant They've been paying rent. They've been taking it. You can't do that. As soon as you gave them notice that you wanted them out and you filed that complaint with the court, your behavior as it is as if you no longer have a landlord-tenant relationship with them and you want possession of your property. Now, because they have these huge dockets, landlords are like, I'm going to take this money. And they just keep taking the money. But they want them out because they have um, Aunt Shirley living in there and she's not supposed to live there. And their acceptance of rent is a waiver <clears throat> of their right to proceed on that issue. So that issue, whatever happened with Aunt Shirley, so landlord says they have unauthorized occupants, then landlord takes money for three months after they filed the complaint, they gave them the right notice. They're the right owner, but they took money from them. So that communicates to the tenant what? We're good. They're taking my money. Sometimes they don't even come to court because they're like, well, they're taking my money. It's okay. That's the biggest thing you can tell people. Always show up on the court. When the court says to show up, always show up. You never know. They're so afraid of it, I think sometimes they don't go. And taking money includes cashing the HUD check. So yes, yes, acceptance of rent. Now, here's what they do about that, and there's some legitimacy to this, okay? That HUD money is automatically sent out, okay? Every month, based on the person's eligibility, HUD's going to pay. They're not going to be the reason. We have had landlords who successfully said, judge, we've, we've returned these funds. So it's not automatic. It, it depends on the, the landlord's behavior. Um, and, and I'll give it to them. It's not an easy thing to shut off an automatic thing like that. It's going to keep coming. So, um, yeah. The judges, the judges tend to believe the landlords on that. If they have somebody who under oath says, judge, we're not accepting rent, we've alerted HUD, we're returning these funds. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't argue that. Yes. So just to sit down here. So I was working with someone who was paying partial rent every single month. They couldn't pay the full amount, so the landlord wanted them out. Acceptance of any amount. So that it was like granted, like basically because you owe them this certain amount, you missed a month, you have seven days. They didn't have legal aid, so they had seven days to either get out and or pay the full amount. They ended up getting out in the seven days. However, the landlord went and put it on their credit report, like basically reported that they owe them money still. Okay. Are they allowed to do that? No. Okay. If the, if the case is dismissed okay. because they vacated, the eviction should not be on the credit report. So you do this like you would any dispute for a credit report company. Okay. You dispute the eviction and your client can get a copy of any eviction dismissal at the county, uh, the district court clerk eviction person. It's on the third floor. It's just down the hall from 308, which is where the eviction court is. Okay. And those clerks can give them a copy of the dismissal. They can submit that to their credit reporting agency and it must come off. Okay. The fact that it existed should not be on any credit report. Okay. Okay. The person can also 
show the dismissal to anyone they've applied with because mm -hmm. this is a process that takes time and you're trying to get housed and it's not going to come off your credit report quick. So you can give a copy of the dismissal to the person you're applying for. The problem with that is mm -hmm. it's also a disclosure that I went through an eviction process. So, you know, I tell people it's up to you. If you think it would be helpful, show them the dismissal, explain that you worked it out with them that, you know, I don't know, explain your side, <laughs> but it should come off the credit report as soon as it's disputed. Yes. So let me get straight because I have this right with what I find in mind right now. Okay. The got eviction notice is said I'm going to get out, but I'm still going to owe them $1,200. Right. You're saying that if it's dismissed and she gets out, she doesn't owe the, she can get that off of her. I'm not saying that. I'm okay. saying the eviction judgment should not be on the credit report. Okay. But now, she was still on the company. She was still on the company, but they yeah. can't just go and put okay. that debt. They have to get a judgment for that debt. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, it makes sense. They have to go through the process of collections and secure their right to that, you know, it's, and if with $1,200, that's likely like half of that's the security deposit. Nine times out of 10, the landlords do not do those security deposit stuff correctly. So when they sue on the rent, if you can present the case on the security deposit, you've already got it down significantly. So there's just a lot of, yeah, they can't just poof, put it up there. It is still owed. And we tell our clients it is still owed, but there are, legitimate arguments to what is owed. If that if that landlord pursues them on that rent, that's another thing that they could call legal aid about. Now I will tell you, small claims court is like a boxing ring. It's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. um, the most important thing to do in small claims court is to have your lease and make sure that everything that they're claiming is justified under the lease. That's what I tell people. Read your lease. I had a lady the other day. I kid you not. They sent us the ledger. The ledger had $100 late fees for every single month that she was late. Guess how much the late fee is in the lease? $5. <laughs> I wish. $50. <laughs> That's significant. Yeah. That's significant. So you've got to have your lease and know, is this charge legitimate under my lease? Then these mobile home parks, they tag all kinds of crap onto their leases. And I mean, it's just nuts. There's like a hundred dollar trash removal fee for like a bag of trash. Um, just, just crazy stuff. Like I read through it and I'm like, this is just so ridiculous. Um, a lot of those, you can make arguments against them because one, the mobile home parks are terrible about updating their tenants with notice on their fees. So they'll just up the fee, but never do an, an official notice. And if they can't prove that they notice the tenants on the increase, they can't collect it. The other thing they do is they raise the rent of the lot, and this happens in apartments too, they raised the rent, they never did an official notice, and the person didn't sign a new lease. How much does that person owe? They owe the amount they signed for. Just because you notice somebody doesn't mean that you can, that they agreed to pay that. Now, if you don't want them because they refuse to sign a new lease, you better do it right. You better move to evict them. So what about a situation where the tenant decides they don't want to go to eviction court and eviction has not been filed, but they're going to go ahead and just, they talk to the landlord, they're going to turn their keys in at the end of the month. But at that point, they find out that the landlord has gone back and charged, or they have like $3,000 on the credit report that they owe to the landlord. So in the conversation, they turned in their keys, they ended their lease on good terms. What, you know. Everything's a process. So once it's on the credit report, you have to follow the dispute process. 
and you're going to submit your lease, which says, this is what I owe, not that. You know, you're, it's, a, it's a dialogue. <laughs> they have to prove that they're owed that money in order to post it on the credit report. Many of them have no evidence or proof. They're just submitting it as an issue. So you can challenge that, but you have to follow the dispute process. Yeah. I don't know if this ever happens, but you know, we obviously we've got a whole lot of COC HUD funding and we pay eight, you know, we pay most of the rent, clients pay 30%. But what happens is a lot of times that you mentioned it, the late fees, right? So on the tenant portion, if you are able to get a case dismissed, does the judge ever rule about late fee or that's not part of it, right? It's either dismissed or it's not. I mean, because a lot of these, you know, our client is left with, instead of it being really only a thousand dollars owed, it's more like 2,500 because of all these stupid fees. Yeah. That's really started since, I mean. It's really bad. Yeah. I know. The, the landlord's on steroids. Right? We <laughs> haven't, we haven't, and this is just, this is just me talking about legal aid. We haven't done the best job addressing this because of volume. It gets into technicalities. It requires you to ask for a ledger. It requires you to review the lease many times. We don't even have that lease till the landlord files it for their case. So we're getting it the day before our trial and we're like reading the lease, you know. So, but I want to do better with the late fees provision. There is actually, and if you look at your outline, the um Geralta has protections. It's Page two under D, prohibited terms of rental agreements. And it prohibits specifically requiring the tenant to pay the landlord's attorney's fees. Almost every single case that we have includes that provision. And we have failed to attack that. Um, we're working on that now strategically. We're going to hit it. We're even, I'm, I'm very seriously concerned considering involving the AG because it is a practice that the judges have permitted. Hmm. They've permitted it. And it's right there. It's right there. Um, so the thing about the difficulty about it in, in preventing the eviction from happening because of the fees is this. After that notice period passes, so I'm just going to Briefly talk to you about notice. If it's non payment, it's how many days? Who knows? 30, 30. 30. 30 if it's a federal property, seven if it's a private property. The 30 day notice period is still being heavily litigated. We have HUD property owners who are only giving seven day notices for non payment. You're, you're talking about like tax credit property. We're talking about, I have some like just, just Section 8 tenant LMHA properties where they're doing seven day notices. We believe they should be doing 30. We've taken a case all the way to the court of appeals on this. Is this any kind of tenant based? Yeah, it's a split. Or project based. Project based. It's a split. Different court of appeals have ruled differently on this issue because it's all about the CARES Act and whether or not it still applies and whether or not once the emergency was over, it still applied. All the people who advocate for individuals in those situations are arguing it's 30 days, it still applies. All the people who are done with COVID and all the protections are arguing seven days. So you're still gonna have a fight in court, but most non-payment cases are seven. A lot of those property owners get the, the population and they just do the 30 to spare themselves the frustration. And that was my ask, they do seven, you 50-50, but you win. Now they have to go back, issue a 30 day notice in the right. process. Of we used to win every time on that, but we got a bad ruling in the circuit court. Thank you, Ann Bailey Smith. <laughs> um, has this been brought to the entire coalition for the homeless? Has what been brought? These issues that you're speaking on. The reason why I say that is because they lead to our homeless issue. Um, oh, yeah. Know, folks. Yeah, um, we've, we've got George Eklund, who um, mm -hmm. 
My we're point is, off of this, yeah. my actual point is, um, if we could, while Victoria is still in office, lift this up, we can pull a quick campaign so maybe that we can um, also influence at the state level. Because I'm sure rural areas are going through the same thing, especially with the housing. To argue for the 30 days. To argue for the 30 days. And um, it was that other provision that you named? Is that so? Oh, the issue of attorney's fees being included in this yes. ban. Let me finish telling you about why we don't win on this, on that issue. So okay. yes, talk to your legislators, advocate. Um, we do not have a tenant-friendly legislature right now. So I'm not sure how far anything would go. We can't even get the expungement of, of um, eviction judgments going. You can get criminal charges expunged, but you can't get an eviction right. That's insane. It is. Yes. You look unique. Yeah. Is Sorry. Okay? They were like, I think I was, but honestly, I was just... <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, real quick. So you're saying that's the reason why? I was going to finish telling you why we're not doing well on the attorney fee issue. Okay. And here's why. That person gets that seven or 30 day notice, right? After that period, the, the attorney can file, the, the landlord can file the eviction. They don't have to accept any money after that notice period. So because they don't have to, they can say, well, we'll accept it if you pay this eviction filing fee. Mm -hmm. So it is, it's not a sure thing that we would win because after that notice period passes, you do not have a right to pay. They don't have to accept anything. So people end up paying it because they're like, well, I just want to work it out. So they're like, but I'll just pay it because I want to stay. And, you know, they don't have to do that either. Like they can just move and not pay it. Um, but that's the difficulty. That's why people end up paying it is because they know that the landlord doesn't have to take a penny. Um, question about like how they act. Um, like you said that they can't accept money after they sit filed with the court, correct? Mm -hmm. So I've had a member who like actually would work for the landlord around like the apartment complexes. Mm. So would that technically count? That is, if someone is employed by their landlord, they're excluded from some of the protections of your Alta. So that is a unique situation and it's something we need to know as soon as the person. So specific exclusions from your Alta is 2E on the first page, occupancy by an employee of a landlord mm -hmm. whose occupancy is conditioned on their employment. So their protections may be even less because that's that's a contractual relationship, the employment, even if it's not right. and the lease. It's going to be more like a non to jurisdiction. It's going to be based on the terms of the lease and the conditions of the employment. And then my next question would be, so say you get a late payment, like say you're 30 days late on your rent and the landlord gives you notice, like you have seven days to pay or I'm filing um, right. for eviction. So you're saying they can be evicted, like get a court date within like how many days? After the seven or yeah. 30, whichever notice they give them passes, they can file. Once they file, they can't accept rent or do anything that indicates the tenancy continues, like enter into a new lease. I find that one all the time. People sign a new lease when they're in eviction court. Like, and I'm like, I'm sorry that your property management company is so confused that they would enter into a new lease with someone after they've moved to evict them. That's silly. Like, that's a mistake. Yes. Um, you said something about. If they give you a notice that they're increasing your rent, do you have to update your lease? Yes. So, if I'm not yes. aware, update mm -hmm. my rent every four months, and yeah. I've never signed a new lease. Yes. So, that's a problem for him. Yeah. I've already gone up $300 in the last two years. So, wow. so the other, <laughs> the other issue with that is, is that the judge can look at the behavior of both parties. So if you have continued to pay the increased amount, mm -hmm. that's acquiescence in a sense. 
I'm not saying it's fair or it's right. I'm just saying your lease, the, the, the lease contract that you made cannot be amended unilaterally. Right. Because, like, I don't know if you be able to think that's the height at all. But, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So, literally, it's a community, and everybody is like, the ghost. And so, your landlord is you increasing the rent uh -huh. with just... Like, like, like a notice, but no new leases are being no signed. We get a 14 day notice that, hey, your rent's going up next month. And you need to read the lease cards too. Some leases include an automatic increase provision, mm -hmm. many do not. So read your lease. They always blame it on maintenance, but we don't even have maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. Yes. Yeah, I mean, normally we have clients that are already already houseless. However, I had a client that called me because she, she was in the process of getting evicted and she was just trying to see what her shelter options were. Earlier, so you said something that's probably going to be up for her today. So, she got last week, she got the seven day to be out this Friday. Her biggest issue is that she is deathly afraid of never having to get an apartment again with an eviction on her record. So, did I hear you correctly when you said when she's out on Friday, she needs to go back to court and let the court know that she is out and that she turned her keys in? So the seven-day notice is a letter from a landlord. It's not service of an eviction. Is that what she got? She called. I have been working with her. This was her second time going to court. So by the time I got to court with her, it was she didn't come up with her money. So the first day that she went to court, she entered the agreement to be out. She has to go back and yeah. tell the judge she's out. Yes. Now, do I all, guess that's my question do all that landlords, a lot of landlords will just say dismiss because they're aware that they're out, but that's her case. And we can't trust the person who's suing us to dismiss our case. We have to go, we have to make sure the judge knows we're out. That's how I explain to clients. Like, they may dismiss it voluntarily, but they sued you. You need to be there and make sure what happens is what you, you expected. So she needs to go back to court the next week. So she's going to be out this Friday. She needs to go back the next week when they have and just set, tell the judge that she is out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I don't know when her review date is. It depends on when she first went. Okay. But she can check that with the clerk if she's not sure. So she needs to check her review date. Okay. When's her review date? Okay. With the eviction court clerk. Usually when a landlord files with the the court, um, how long does the tenant have until they show up on court docket? It's months. Months. So they can technically live there. That's why I asked if that was a seven day notice letter or from a landlord or if it was something with the court. But you're telling me she's in court. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's why. Yeah. Once you get the seven day notice letter, they may file the eviction mm -hmm. right away, but it'll be a while before their case is set on the docket. And they can't remove you until the case is. You can vacate. Right. If you want to get out and return your keys, but you still need to show up for your yeah, day. Right. But they can't remove you from it. They cannot without a setup. Not I feel like so many people get that seven day eviction and they just leave. Mm -hmm. like, but I think they do too. Mm -hmm. and um, then is that going to be on the record? The uh, no. It should be dismissed. The problem is they just move after the seven day notice letter. They don't turn the keys in. They don't tell the landlord that they've moved here. So the landlord doesn't know where they are to notice them. Their phone doesn't work. You know, it's just the communication with the landlord is essential. Are they allowed to enter your unit? Without notice? No, that's that one of the provisions of your alter. They have to give notice before they come in. Okay. So let's talk about, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to move for one second a little bit further in. Um, what is the point of all this? And this is what I tell volunteer attorneys who want to do these cases. They want to help people. I'm telling them, look, if they have a legal defense, we want to get them more time. And... We want to give them just a little bit more grace so that they don't get that judgment on their record. The issues are all still the same. They still owe. 
there's probably still a problem going on. Sometimes we get a lease violation allegation and we litigate it and it never comes back because we prove that it didn't happen or that it was a mistake on the part of the property management. Um, but for the most part, every eviction is just coming right back around. So instead of ticking off the landlords, a lot of time what we'll do is we'll say, you did this wrong. So I'm going to make a motion to dismiss. But I won't do that if you give them 30 days. Because the person wants to maintain that relationship. They want to remain in the property. Now, if they hate it there, we're not going to do that. We're going to be like, they want 30 days to move. <laughs> we haven't, we, you know, it's going to cost that landlord the time to get back on the docket, the time to do the notice letter. It's in their interest to give our client more time. And then we work it out. That's a lot of what we do because these are cyclical. Um, if I know this case is coming right back around, I try to get them about the amount of time that it would take for the landlord to get back in court. That's the, that's the advocacy. Then they feel like you did them a solid. They're going to be less hostile with your client. Maybe they won't pursue the past due rent you know, in court, go after them or pursue a judgment. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it will be better for your client in the long run if we just, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to agree to. This is fair based on the defenses that I have. So that's what we're doing. We're trying to get a dismissal so it doesn't permanently stain their record, and we're trying to give them time. That's the goal. So that way I'm clear, the eviction will be dismissed. So we'll say that it basically won't show up on the record that they've ever been dis uh, evicted, but it will show up as a balance owed to whatever apartment complex or yeah. whatever. They're, 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 you know, they're a business like any other business. Okay. If they're owed money, they have their rights. They have to go through whatever process they have to go through to get that report. So that's past. They can ask for the past due rent, but it just won't show up as eviction. Yes. And the other thing people need to be aware of and that they need to advocate for is, hey, if I'm going, the, the landlord automatically has an obligation to re-rent that apartment. And with the housing crisis, they likely will. Most landlords have a list, a waiting list. And what's so weird is, I think like one landlord's waiting list is, is the other the other landlord's eviction list. <laughs> I mean the whole thing, like if you look at it, it's just crazy. But um, but yeah, so you know, they have an obligation to re-rent that apartment. And if they re-rent that apartment, they can't pursue that person for the balance of the lease, the forward months. But if they cannot re-rent it, they can pursue them for the balance of the lease. So if I have a client who signed a lease in September and they're in court in October, I'm going to convey strongly to the landlord's attorney that you did something wrong here because this person cannot afford this place. You didn't make sure that they were capable of this and that's on you and I want you to cancel the lease because I feel like there's, you know, they just signed. Like, there's some due diligence issues on your client's part. So we'll get out and we'll do it quick <coughs> if you cancel the balance of lease. If you have a good legal defense, you can argue that, you can negotiate that, um, and try to help them not have that responsibility. So more time and a dismissal. Um, so things y'all can do to help your clients. <laughs> keep a copy of their lease. If you don't trust them now, <laughs> maybe you can keep one. Um, uh, make sure that they know who to reach out to. Legal Aid is going to point them to uh, shelter resources and to rental assistance resources. So it's sort of okay to just send them the legal aid. Um, they can call us if they qualify for our services and get counsel and advice whether or not they're in eviction court yet. 
They can talk to one of our intake people. Right now we have a housing intake specialist, Teresa Thomas, and she all she does is intake for housing. And she has been in court with Gwen Horton, who is one of our best attorneys for a year and a half. So she is very familiar with how it works and can really help people. And also listen, sometimes they're just so mad, you know, and they just need somebody to listen to their side of this is what happened. Um, so uh, that's that's the stuff, helping them, helping them have the paperwork that we would need to help them. Um, how's our time? What time? Okay, we're getting there. Um, so like I said, you can do the trial. They're just going to do what? Turn right around, re-notice, and refile. But you can do the trial. There's a risk of getting a judgment. Like 90% of the cases do end in an agreement. But I will tell you this, and I'll make this harder on my legal aid attorneys. If you have a legal defense and you only get that person one week, you didn't help them at all. They could have done that on their own. So if we have a legal defense, we're looking at getting them more time, two, three, 30 days, two, two weeks, three weeks, 30 days, something more because they have a defense that they could present to the court to get that case dismissed. So, um, and then, um, then there's the standard agreement, which if, you're, if your tenant, your person that you're working with calls legal aid and there is no defense to the case, we're gonna be really nice and we're gonna listen to everything they wanna say. And then we're gonna tell them, you need to take the agreement and move it. And you don't need a lawyer to do that. So it's a tough conversation. I'm so sorry. You have a smart landlord, one in 10, and they did it right. <laughs> and they did it right. And I'm so sorry. But you're saving them a lot of like hassle with the stopping them. Except, that. yeah. And they're still informed. Um, and I tell people to this, which this is very, very, very sad, but it is a reality. The standard agreement was offered to everyone on their first sitting until we had a new judge take the bench. And she allows landlords to go forward on the first sitting. So not only do I tell people, hey, you need to do this, but you also need to check and make sure they're offering it because they'll go forward on the first sitting sometimes. When there's real animosity between a tenant and a landlord, they have no incentives and they're not required to do it. Does she know she's part of the problem? Who? The judge. <laughs> um, hopefully she's not Googling your trainings and watching them. <laughs> but that's my job. I mean, that's the, that's the legal system, right? That's the legal system. Yeah, Rebecca, how, so I know we're talking mostly about like landlords not getting paid today, but how much are you seeing uh, around excessive damage or noise complaints? Um, making it to so I would say for every 25 non payment cases, there's a lease violation case. Okay, so 25. Yeah, right. the majority are non payment. Um, but people think that a non payment case is pretty cut and dry, it really isn't. Like I said. This person has been charged $100 late fees for years when our lease said 50. Mm -hmm. You know, like there are defenses to non payment cases. You know, the, the landlord switched things up. They, they changed the method of payment. They accepted money orders for, for two years, judge. And then all of a sudden she can't pay that way. And that, that's what, you know, there, there are lots of ways to advocate in a non payment case. Lots of ways. Um. If I wanted to learn more about, like, um, you said that it's Jefferson County, Lexington, and Shelbyville City that go under the, these guidelines for eviction. Uh -huh. So for the other counties in Kentucky, how can I go about learning, like, what the rules? So Legal Aid has an eviction law portal. If you go to Legal Aid Society, find us, Legal Aid Society, and you go to How Can I Help, and there's a drop-down menu, and it says volunteer or, you know, it's like a volunteer programs. And then you scroll down 
once you hit the volunteer programs, there's a big, big thing that says volunteer eviction events. Click on that. All of these trainings are up there. Anybody can see them. Anybody can watch them. Um, the PowerPoints are attached to those. You don't have to be a lawyer to go and look at those videos. But like I said, if you know a lawyer, I want their name. <laughs> I want to talk just briefly because I know we're almost out of time um, about maintenance. So maintenance is not a defense to a non-payment case. Don't hate me. It's in the law. <laughs> it, it, takes, it takes following a very specific process in order to cancel your lease because of maintenance issues or to be able to use your own money to fix that lease. We give advice and counsel to people all the time on how to do that and they do it wrong. It's a very specific process. If you have a maintenance issue that they will not fix, you give them written notice. How many of y'all think our clients give written notice about anything? No. You give them written notice, they have 14 days, the landlord has 14 days to fix it, okay? Um, if they don't fix it, then the options, they're so wonderful. You can use up to half a month's rent to fix the problem. How many of you think that any maintenance issue at all can be fixed with half a month's rent? <laughs> exactly, none. That is not a real option. The other option is to cancel the lease and move. Do our people have anywhere to go? No, so they're stuck. Now, when it matters is when the person is officially displaced by the maintenance issue. There are essential services. These are listed in here in this outline. Let me point it out to you. We're on page five in the Eralta section. And then actually it's page six at the top. If the landlord willfully and materially fails to correct a non-compliance which affects health and safety, the tenant may notify the landlord. You can use that. That's the one half rent or the whatever. Um, that's not the section we need to draw attention to. Yeah, um, there's a list under KRS 383, 595. What page? It's and this is five. on five under two B. Thank you, thank you guys. Must be fit and habitable. And here's the list. This is the only stuff, okay? where we can really get into a conversation about <laughs> maintenance. Maintain in good, safe working order all of the following. Electrical, plumbing, sanitary, heating, ventilating, air conditioning, if they had it when they moved in, running water and hot water. They also have to have heat between two particular times of year. So if the person is having an issue, a major issue, this is not my toilet is clogged, the landlord has 14 days to get somebody out there and clear the toilet. We're talking about no plumbing. Yes. What about excess? I have a couple of clients that are dealing with an excessive young patient. That is going to be typically okay. So I always tell people, look at your lease. What did your lease say about? What does your lease say about termination or issues? They just have to respond to it. So what the problem is, is the person reports it, then they send somebody out to spray. Then the person reports it and they send somebody out to spray. So it's it's a reasonability kind of thing. Are they responding to the complaint? Um, so it's, it's tough. I'm never gonna do a maintenance case based on mold. There's mold in every building in the city. Um, I, I did, one woman had a, a daughter with asthma who had been hospitalized and we got them to terminate the lease and um, reduce some of her rent that she had because she had to find somewhere else for the child to go. She was displaced because of the conditions. 
that is significant and something where we can that the landlords required to provide an alternative housing under the lease. So a lot of leases have crazy language about how if the tornado hits and the place is destroyed, I don't owe you anything. It's debatable. <laughs> and that's gonna be that's gonna be on a case by case basis. So because crazy. you have a lease for them to provide housing and if they don't, they have to provide alternative housing. Uh, just to understand the fix or respond, uh, I was talking to a landlord whose version of respond is sent a maintenance person out to visually assess. And they were like, well, we've responded, right? We came out and we looked at it. <laughs> and we disagree. And well, they were like, we see it. <laughs> we, yeah. got, we got it. We yeah. responded. I think it's clear it's fixed the issue. Okay. So then, then you then you then you want to send it's really important to send really clear documentation. And here's the other thing people don't do. <laughs> they spend half their month's rent towards fixing something and they document nothing. Mm. They have no receipts, and the landlord's like, you didn't spend that money on, on the issue. Like and so I think I've had I've seen I've been at legal aid three and a half years doing this and I've seen one case where the person documented what they spent it on. Jeez. Yeah. Okay, so that's the the stuff. Um <laughs> do y'all did y'all see that news article? The one lady who uh she went to eviction court and the code and enforcement, she got code and enforcement involved and she was all over the news. Um, and she got the court to um, she got the court to listen to her. All right, there's no self help eviction in Jefferson County. Tell them to call the police. They set me out. Here's my lease, which they won't have, but we can still try to help them. Um, there's no self help eviction. You have to have a set out order. We will look at appeals, but typically we only look at appeals if we represent it in the district court. So um, you'll be surprised to know that the Ralta protections are actually better than what others have. I know it seems harsh what we've looked at today. <laughs> Oh, but I'm grateful that we have these protections and we can make these arguments on behalf of folks. And I appreciate your time. I so appreciate the, the dialogue and you all participating. Um, don't hesitate to reach out. We can get your PowerPoint from your yeah, yeah, I will attach that. This will be posted on the coalition's website. Oh, okay. um, so give me your uh, evaluation. And if you need a certificate for today, let me know. I can fill one out for you real quick. I need one. Can you one Okay. Anybody else Okay. 